Hi, I'm Harvey Hubble. You're watching Seedling.tv, nourishing mind, body, and planet. Subscribe now. It's good for you. Today we will be talking about maize, which is also known as corn. How many of you have grown corn or have at least seen corn? Okay, I would hope so. Probably GMO corn, but that's fine. What is maize? Maize or corn is a grass. It is kind of like bamboo, but it is a true grass, and it is a labor of the indigenous peoples of the Americas for thousands of years. And it is also a form of sustenance around the world. Because of its indigenous value to the Americas, it's most valued within North, Central, and South America. And I'm afraid it's also been one of the very, very things that have been incorporated into the evils of genetic modification. It is one of the, if not the most, genetically modified crop across the globe. And the origins are something that I find very fascinating. I am a history buff, and I always have been. And the book that I have written that is at the end of this presentation goes through a lot of the origins of the crop that we know today. And it is a very complex and very complicated origin story for corn. We know that 9,000 years ago in the Balsas River Valley of Mexico, a wild grass known as Zia maize subspecies parvoglumus Balsas River Tiacente was selected by the indigenous peoples to become corn, maize. And it is before Tiacente's domestication that we are actually thinking that they chew the stalks of the Tiacente plant to take the sugars that are naturally found in these and they also discover the grain, which they would end up keeping, selecting and selecting until they finally get the modern corn crop that we know today. Ear size is very small. Early domesticated corn was about that big, about a half inch to an inch long. And it kept growing and growing, but these very small, very tiny early forms of what I call wild domesticated maize is what began to spread outside of Mexico because Mexico is the home of corn. Always has been and always will be. And this picture is a corn in Mexico called Chapalote. It is the oldest corn in the world. It is the oldest corn of North America. It is typically noted, noted for the brown hues that it carries. I call it chocolate corn because it looks like chocolate, but does it taste like chocolate? This is my reconstruction of early maize. This is what it would have looked like a few thousand years after its initial domestication from Tiacente. And for those of you that have not seen Tiacente, it is a very, very weird looking plant. I have the corn display in the squash hall that has actual Tiacente ears. They're about two to three, four inches long, and the seed looks like rocks. They're hard as rocks too. You would chip your tooth if you ate one. But this would be a representation of a early chapalote or another race called Naltel that is also endemic or found in Mexico and other parts of Central America. And this brings me to the chapalote Naltel complex. Chapalote and Naltel are found in the archaeological caves in Mexico. They are pretty much indistinguishable from each other. They look almost identical. And the only way that the archaeologists can tell them apart is seed color. This is a picture of gnaw tail. It is typically orangish hued or white and yellow with some red mixed in. And this one, we do not know if it formed with Chapalote or from what research I've done, it came from Chapalote. When Chapalote is crossed with other types of corn, it ends up turning the color to this orange bronze hue. And pollo is a corn from Colombia that is a derivative of the Nautel complex. Corn initially was domesticated in Mexico. These tiny ears or form like this spread into Central America down to South America where it would become the four or five hundred different types of corn found in South America. 
These are from the cave in Mexico. These are archaeological ears that are charred. A lot of these specimens were charred like this. But these are not the oldest. The oldest comes from the, either the San Marcos or the Guilla cave, and they are about 5,000 years old. But you can see in this how we started with a rather smaller ear, and it kept progressing and progressing bigger. And actually, this is a picture. The very far left ear here is Tiacente. This is the mother of all corn. The second ear is also Tiacente, but the final two is what often happens in Mexico. Tiacente is often allowed to cross with modern corn. It improves the variety that they cross it to. This, was, this back crossing and recrossing were, was done numerous times over corn's evolution. That's why if some of you grow certain types of corn, it ends up actually looking a lot like wild grass. And that's because it has more tiacente in its background. General corn plant botany, there's no need for an actual description. It's obvious the parts of the plant. At the very top, what looks like a head, so to speak, is the tassel. You have the leaves, you have an ear, which is the actual fruit of the corn. The kernels are also the actual seed that is on the ear. You have your stalk. The silk is the hair-like spaghetti-looking um, female portion of the plant that will end up becoming pollinated and that will give you the corn kernel. And of course, at the very bottom, you have brace roots. Corn will grow an initial set of roots when it germinates. That will be its founding root system. As it grows taller, each nodule that looks like a bamboo stalk will have roots come down from it. Usually they end above the ground level, and you'll have roots that come off to help brace the plant during wind, rain, whatever. Some types of maize throughout the world actually have roots that come from half the stalk down the plant. They don't always reach the ground, but in some types they do. Or if your plant falls over, it'll actually root its, re root itself along the nodes. That's why when corn blows over, it'll just happily root and pop back up. Tia Sente does an amazing job of this. How many of you have heard the word tiller? Tiller, T-I-L-L-E-R. Like kind of like a rototiller, but a tiller. It's the fancy word for what is known as a sucker in corn. This central stalk that you see that is not circled is the main stalk, and everything outside of that are what are called tillers, or suckers. Native American corn, indigenous corn, ancient corn, wild corn, this is actually a Tiacente plant. It has these suckers on them. It is part of the plant. Many sources will actually tell you, well, they're horrible. Clip them off, remove them. They often grow back, and they also feed your plant more nutrients through photosynthesis. That's why you don't want to cut these off. They do more for the plant than the harm that some people claim they do. They've never been removed up until GMO modification decided that we don't like tillers, let's keep them off our plants. Some of the older heirloom dent corns are actually free of tillers, but either way, all corn used to have these. And corn reproduction is simple, and it's also one of the easiest things to end up having cross-pollinated. The left picture is of a ear with a shoot bag over it, which we will get to later in the presentation. And the finger-like hair is what's called silk. This is the female portion of the corn plant. Each silk must be pollinated for a kernel to form. If all silks do not get pollinated, you will not get a full ear of corn. And various factors influence how well you get pollinated. Water, temperature, which we will get into um, down the presentation here. On the right is a tassel. This is the male portion of, of the corn plant. The little feather-like shoes, or whatever you want to call them that you see hanging, those are anthers. They produce the yellow pollen that is required for pollination in corn. Heirlooms and land races are a rather confusing topic if you really dig deeper into what they are. An heirloom is really a land race. And many of us may have heard the term land race because it applies to both plants and animals, often cattle and sheep and whatever else you want to call it. A land race is a dynamic group of populations bearing a historical origin, 
genetic diversity, and a distinct identity or morphological. They are typically adapted to a very specific region, a very specific way of being grown, and they often have various names attached to them. And an heirloom, loosely defined in general, is a land race that has been passed down through a family for generations and generations, specifically around the time frame predating World War II. Every heirloom expert will define heirloom differently, but it's a general consensus that that's what an heirloom is. It predates World War II. And heirlooms and land races, whichever you want to call them, because they're technically the same thing, really, because they share the majority of the same common characteristics, they are some of the best diversity, or the best diversity, that we have left in this world. The tainting and evils that genetic modification has done to a crop that has been sacred to the indigenous peoples of the Americas is absolutely disgusting. We have weaved out, destroyed a lot of the diversity that I will be showing in the later um, slides of this presentation. And in the back, I actually have a table that has ears of some of these in this presentation. And here we have, I love political cartoons, and this is one of my favorites. It is the big food as the witch, and she is telling the figure that will be Snow White, don't fret about the genetic engineering because that's what we all hear. It's not bad, it's fine, eat it, you'll live. Even though it's what's destroying a lot of stuff in the world. Then you have a little chipmunk groundhog character that's asking the guy spraying these chemicals, would you eat that with your mask on? I wouldn't. Squirrels and raccoons leave genetically modified corn alone. All the heirloom stuff I grow, they go right for it. And then you have Monsanto's hand grasping Mother Nature, which is what's really been happening across the globe. Genetically modified corn has been entering the homeland of corn, Central America, South America, even illegally, where it is crossing with these native heirlooms and land races found there. And this ruins the genetic diversity that these crops have had for thousands of years. This picture is a good example of diversity. This is a group of corns from North America, Central, and South America. The purple and white is a corn from Guatemala called Negro de Tierra Caliente. The sweet corn is from North America. The popcorn is from South America. The blue corn and yellow corn is from North America. And diversity is our global crop protection. How many of you have heard the term monoculture? All corn produced today, genetically modified, is monoculture. With heirlooms, it's a little bit different when you get into that term. These plants have a ton of genetic diversity within them. Genes and DNA are running rampant through these. And they have adaptations that you do not find in genetically modified corn. D GMO corn is designed to be specific to a region, whether it be the southwest U.S., if it'll be Ohio, if it'll be New York. That's the only place they're adapted to grow. You move one from New York, say, to 8,000 feet in elevation, it'll die. It cannot adapt. These corns like this, they can adapt. It's not easy to do, as we will see, but it is not impossible. There's at least around 400 land races of corn alone within the Americas, North, Central, and South America. And globally, a few thousand exist, four or 5,000 at least. Soil is a key component of corn. It provides the water and the nutrients that the crop needs. Corn prefers rich, fertile soil, as many of you have probably gardened before. All of your garden plants usually prefer this. Well draining, it must be well draining unless you have a corn that comes from a swamp. I do have some that are grown in a region that gets 400 inches of rain a year, and it is perfectly happy. It needs to be well draining or it will rot. Corn does not like wet feet. And the heirlooms and land races are an exception to a lot of these rules. They can grow in some of the poorest, worst looking soils that you may have in your garden or your yard. 
A part of my yard has nothing but rock and some red clay dirt to it. It's 99% rock. I have a corn from Mexico that grows six, eight feet tall in this soil, and I don't even fertilize it at all. It is perfectly happy being grown there because it is adapted to it. There's pretty much a corn for every soil type. Whether it is wet, whether you are in, you know, on an island in Canada, corn has been throughout all of the Americas and around the globe. And full sun. You can grow corn in shade, but it's not very happy. It's kind of like some people without coffee. It's just not very happy without full sun. Temperature and time are another key factor. As much as I wish I could plant a seed and it grow the next day and be fully mature, I can't do that. But it is a warm weather, heat loving crop. It is one of the crops that even though the climate is shifting so badly, I foresee actually sticking around, except for the stuff found in higher elevations that are much cooler. The low, more lowland stuff that is grown in the hotter, warmer regions around the world, they will probably be pretty much okay. But germination takes place best around 60 degrees or warmer. You can plant corn on an 80 degree day and it'll be up two or three days later. And the best growth actually occurs at night, not during the day. When it gets really hot, your corn plant shuts down. It'll wait until nighttime when temperatures cool off and it will not lose as much water. That's when it'll begin growing. And ideally when the temperatures at night are 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, your corn plant will take off growing. And some varieties can handle cold soil. You can plant them in 32 degree soil and they'll germinate. It may take a little while, but other corn that you do that with will actually die out. And most corn is a term that is called day neutral. It means that you can plant it anywhere in the United States and it'll make a tassel and an ear at the same time. Some southwestern corn, Central and South American corn, and from Mexico is not day neutral. It is day length sensitive, which we will get into um, down the slides here. Tropical types like those from down that region will have to have short day lengths that they naturally get where they come from. A lot of these are actually, um, of course, tropical, but they come from regions near the equator that get more short days and a longer growing season. And you do want to plant your corn generally in 60 to 7 degree or higher soil. Of course, if you're like 110, you may have popcorn in the ground, but if you're hungry, I guess you could go out and eat it, but I mean, corn is an extremely, extremely heavy nitrogen user. It will not be a very happily green plant without a lot of nitrogen. And as many of you probably have heard, modern GMO corn is bred to love synthetic fertilizers. NPK, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus are the three key fertilizer ingredients, so to speak, or nutrients more so, that your corn plant needs. Nitrogen is especially taken in during reproduction, when an ear is forming and when a tassel is being formed. Magnesium is also required. Heavy water use is also very, very, very common during reproduction. Corn in general is one of the most water requiring crops grown around the world. Unless you get into some of the amazingly adapted corns from some parts of Central, South, and North America that can grow in deserts. The Hopi Indians have some amazing corn that can be grown in deserts. They grow it in their sand dunes. The Navajo have it, the Apache have it. The Moche civilization of Peru used to have, or had a corn called Mochero that was watered twice in its 100 day growing season. That's all the water it needed to make an ear. And if you have good soil already that's already black, which is usually a sign of good fertility, you could probably go at least one year, two years without adding any compost or any nutrients to your soil. I recommend after that initial period, and even if your soil is rich now, add some nutrients to it because corn sucks it out like a vacuum cleaner because it takes so much to feed the plant. Heirlooms and land races generally do not take that much. 
they can survive on less. But when the plant is not green or healthy, the ear quality will keep going down. And your plant could eventually die if it's nutrient poor enough. Pests and diseases in corn I find fascinating. They have evolved originally in parts of Mexico to attack wild teacente. When corn came to be, they spread to that. Leaf blights are absolutely horrid. Many parts of California here, we don't even see some of this here. Back home where I'm from in Tennessee and Kentucky and the rest of the south, we have leaf blight galore. We have the next thing called rust galore because these are humid, tropical loving diseases and they are encouraged by warm, moist weather. Dry weather or high elevation cool temperatures these things do not really survive in and they will not grow. With leaf blight, you can get circular elliptical shaped lesions, which you see here. This is southern corn leaf blight. And they can completely kill your plant. I have some stuff at home that they are completely brown. The only thing green is the stalk. And they are not tolerant or resistant to these leaf blights. And it is caused by a fungus that infects your corn plant. And nearly all of these diseases that we will be going through, if you leave any part of your corn plant in the soil, it will stay there. When you grow corn again, it will spread to it. You're better off burning or discarding some way, somehow, any corn material you have left on your soil. Otherwise, you will be asking for blight and other diseases to be knocking at your door, as well as insects, because they do the exact same thing. Rusts are a type of fungus that infects corn leaves, more so the leaves, but it can infect other parts of the plant. And I'm sure most of you have seen iron rusting. It turns rust colored. That's what your corn plant will look like it's doing, it's rusting. The fungus, when it actually appears and has grown, it'll pop up on your corn plant as these rounded or elongated lesions of spores. If you rub up against this plant, get this on your clothes or your hand, touch another plant, you will spread it. It will infect that plant unless it's resistant to it. There's two types, southern and common. Common rust is again common and it is not as destructive. Southern corn rust is a very, very destructive corn. And we are starting to see more signs of this stuff spreading farther and farther as more corn is grown. GMO corn is bred to mostly be resistant to this and a lot of these insects. Mother Nature is very adaptable and she does it very, very well. And this stuff can cover the entire leaf. You can have leaves that are nothing but solid fungus. And of course, those are best left untouched. There's a ton more of diseases that affect corn. Those two are the more common. If you grow sweet corn, you may encounter a bacterial, fung a bacterial issue called Stewart's wilt. This is spread by a bug that I believe is in this section called the corn flea beetle. And it can nearly kill all of your corn if it is allowed to spread. Rootworms, I'm sure a lot of you actually recognize these on your cucumbers and your melons. Rootworms are cucumber beetles. They're just under a different name for this crop. Three different species attack corn and cucumbers and melons and whatever else they find delicious in your garden. If it's like mine, they eat everything pretty much. Northern, Southern, and Western. The first one is a Southern, Northern, and a Western. The Northerns are usually a little bit smaller. Their larvae look like little white worms, and these end up boring into your corn plant's root system and devouring most of it. They chew off the roots, which could affect how much water, how much nutrients they are pulling in. Or they could end up weakening your stalk and your whole plant will blow over. It may reroot, but usually when these things are bothering it, they do not. And they also have a very bad habit of chewing the silks of your corn. This is a very horrible thing if you're trying to get full ears for seed increase or if you want a display piece. Each silk they chew off is a kernel you lose. 
they typically feed on pollen, so you wouldn't think they'd ever be a bother to you. However, when they move to the silk, as they commonly do, that's when you can get ears that hardly have anything on them like these. Ear on the far right is perfectly fine. The others have a varying degree of rootworm damage by them feeding on the silks of your ears. This is a major problem, especially where I'm at, because these things reproduce very quickly and they spread very rapidly. Corn borers are a terrible pest, but something I find very cool and very fascinating, even though they do a lot of damage. This picture is of the European corn borer, probably the most well known. There's this species and there's the southwestern corn borer. And these moths lay their eggs on the corn plant, which hatch into caterpillars. They begin feeding on the young leaves of your corn plant before boring into the stalk. Here they tunnel through it as much as they like. They go up, they chew on the leaves, they eat the tassel, go back down, process repeats until at times they kill your entire plant. And these make at least three or four generations a year. As soon as one is over with, the other is getting ready to hatch or getting ready to pupate and getting ready to turn into another moth. The leaf on the left is an example of how to tell if you have corn borer. When they're feeding on the whorl, as they're called, that the leaves come out spiral-like in your corn plant, you will have what is called three bullet hole or shot hole lesions in your leaves. This is where they were feeding on the young leaves when they were tightly bound into the center of the plant and as the leaves unfold and unspiral, you get to see these. And this is on a young plant, but in bigger corn plants, you can have much larger um, holes. And on the right is a example of corn borer, European corn borer. These are in a Native American variety from North Dakota and South Dakota. And you can see just how large these are. They're, to me, they're fascinating because they adapt very quickly. BT, or Bacillus thuringiensis, that is put into corn to kill these things, these are becoming immune, or they are immune to it now. It does not kill them. A lot of the other pesticides that we spray, they're now immune to those. And they're getting bigger. They used to be smaller than this. Lately, they've been getting big as my pinky, and it's sometimes even larger than that. And they should not be this large, obviously. But genetic modification genetically modifies most of the things that eat it. And you can question if that also happens to people. Because at times, what we eat is what we become. Army worms are very well named. They are very destructive. And typically, corn is not their favorite food. They devour everything else in our garden. But if you have young corn that is just starting to grow, these things may invade your soil, or not your soil, your plants. They reproduce rapidly. Hundreds are laid upon one leaf, and they will start eating all of it. They can strip your entire plant clean, and then they'll spread to other parts of your garden and start eating things like that. And these are laid by a moth. Most of the things that affect corn are laid by moths. Their caterpillars are the horrible, evil things that end up devouring what we know. There's two types, the common and the fall. The common is kind of throughout the year, and the fall is typically in the fall. But this year was really funky, and we had fall armyworms in July and June, which is very odd. This is the damage that armyworms can do. This is a very slight damage, so to speak. Usually they eat more than this. But you can see how they go for the soft, chewable material of your corn plant. They don't care what variety it is, they will eat it. If it has resistance to it, you better be saving it because not very many corns have tolerance to armyworms. How many of you know of the Japanese bean beetle? Okay, some of you. These things were introduced from Japan in iris rhizomes in the 19th century. They have progressively spread, they repopulate like crazy, and you can't really get rid of them. 
they devour three, over 300 different types of plants. Typically, they don't bother corn. This year, they were devouring it. Each year, you may see different pests. It just depends on the generation, the warm weather, the raininess, the climate, whatever you want to say. Typically, they don't bother. They eat everything else. And this is the flea beetle that I was talking about that spreads Stewart's bacterial wilt. Sweet corn is especially um, sensitive to this insect, but any other land race or heirloom corn may be affected by this. It just depends on if it has tolerance to it. And a lot of this research is not even studied, so the only way you will know if it's resistant is if you don't get it or if it's infected and it dies, which means it will not be. I'm sure many of you are familiar with aphids. These are little sap-sucking devils, as I call them, that suck the life out of your plant, literally. Most people find me crazy when I say, don't spray them, they don't really bother anything. They won't do much damage because ladybugs and other things usually take care of them. If you're trying to pollinate corn by hand, that's when you run into the issue that the tassels will end up being so full of these that you will have no pollen. That's when you may want to use a soap and water mixture or a organic um, pesticide at your garden center or whatever to control these. But they typically aren't any problem. This is the earworm moth. Earworms are like the corn borer version of eating the corn you won't. They have a very nice taste for sweet corn, and heirlooms and land races they love. Some are more resistant and tolerant than others. Tightly shucked or husked corns, these don't bother as badly because they can't get into the ear. Or if they do, they end up suffocating to death. And the damage that they do can be seen here. This is a pop, it was a popcorn before they got into the ears and started eating. They can eat the entire ear. Usually you have one or two per ear. This year I've had four, five, six worms per ear. And we're talking six to eight inch ears and they've already eaten half of it. They don't stop eating until they get ready to turn into an adult. So you can imagine how hungry they have to be and how much they're gonna end up destroying your crop. Because these things are very, very bad. Most people will probably ask me, well, how do you control the insects? How do you control the diseases? You can't ever get rid of them, truthfully. Eradication is nearly impossible, or it is impossible. These diseases and insects evolved with the crop. The crop evolved with them. It's a cycle. You can use BT if you want to, to control some of these pests. It'll kill them, so to speak, but they're, it'll limit their population, really. For earworms, you can take mineral oil and drop some into the ears, and it will kill them. But you will have some that may survive this. And with diseases and the insects, your best bet is just removing as much old material as you can before you plant your next crop. Otherwise, you're inviting them to stay over the winter, providing housing, providing food, and eventually, when warm weather hits, they're gonna pop out and invade. Daylene sensitive maize is one of my expertise areas. When I was the curator for Baker Creek, this is my, was my specialty. In Soapy, the seed bank that I run, I have 1,200 corns from all around the world. None of them are genetically modified. I grow two to 300 at home by myself every year. I hand pollinate all of these every year. We are surrounded by GMO corn. I am very picky with purity because genetic diversity is what this world is losing. When we lose what we have, we may learn. When we lose what we have, we can't get it back. There is no, oops, snap my fingers and it'll reappear. No, it does not work like that. This is me last year standing behind a 30 foot tall shed. This corn is 30 feet tall and there's about five inches missing from the bottoms of these stalks. When you bring corn from parts of Mexico, Central and especially South America to the United States, they get very tall. 
very, very, very tall. And this is because they do not have the short day lengths like we get during winter when the days shorten and we get longer periods of darkness. Most people think that's reversed. They need more light. They need more darkness. 12 to 18 hours of darkness is required for your corn plant if you bring it from another country here, from at least the Americas, for it to actually tassel and silk at one time. Otherwise, you would get a nice, beautiful tassel with pollen, and three weeks after that tassel has died, you'll get an ear with silk. That's why bringing these from other countries is a risk, but needed because of the diversity that all of these corns have within themselves. Corn is daily insensitive from the tropical regions between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, 33 degrees north to 33 degrees south latitude. Beans and, mo and some squash this also applies to. When corn entered North America in the southwestern United States around 2000 BC from Mexico, it was daily insensitive. The indigenous peoples there had to readapt it to the United States for us to have the corn that we can grow like we have now. Corn is very adaptable. As soon as it's moved from another region, it goes into overdrive trying to adapt where it comes from. It is adapted to a specific region most of the time, and anywhere outside of that, it knows where it's at. Plants are not stupid. Most people think, well, they have no feeling. In a sense, they do. And they know where they're planted. They know when they are planted. They know how much darkness they are getting in order to make a tassel and an ear. They have to know that because it is key to reproduction. In the native regions where most of these corns come from, they don't have to worry about day length because they end up being naturally short. In, other, in some other of the Americas, corn is about to be planted. In Peru, it's usually planted around October, November, and December to be harvested about May or June. Pollination is one of those topics that a lot of people almost throw blow darts at me to knock me out for. But there's open pollinated, which is what Mother Nature has done ever since um, the, the corn genus Zia diverged from another wild grass one to two million years ago. And even that was open pollinated then. Hand pollination is what I recommend to people that do not have the one, two, three, four, fifty miles to isolate corn properly to keep it 100% pure. Hand pollination, you can get 100% pure corn when you do it right. A lot of people don't understand that, well, you told me wrong how to do this. It's really simple to do, and you've just got to learn how to get yourself into a train, so to speak, of pollinating. When I grow two to 300, I have to be fast, otherwise the pollen will end up dying. Because peak pollen shed is about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. When the humidity is not as high and it is warm, but also somewhat cool. Excessive heat or excessive cold, your corn plant will not produce pollen. And when it's raining, it will not produce pollen. If, well, I was going to say if it's snowing, but if you have corn that grows in snow, well, I want some. <laughs> but hand pollination, as I said, when performed right, you get 100% purity. A lot of people do not like the term hand pollination. GMO companies do this, yes. But with most of us living surrounded by that evil stuff, we are forced to hand pollinate. And you have to realize that when hand pollinating, you can screw up the genetic diversity. Time delays are another possibility that you can do. You can plant, say, a 60-day corn with a 100, 110-day corn and be usually perfectly fine. But that's risky because it, if you're really hot or if you get a lot of short days, all of your corn may tassel at once. Even with that being so, I still typically hand pollinate. These are examples of hand pollination. These brown bags are not lunch bags, I promise. They look like them a lot. They are called tassel bags. They are a water and mostly insect proof. Grasshoppers and locusts eat through them. Weatherproof 
bags that you put over the tassels if you decide to bag. Most sources and most experts will tell you, bag your tassels, bag your tassels. I don't. Corn pollen is not designed to stick to a tassel. It is produced by the anthers on the tassel for pollinating the silk. Thus, they only stick to silk. If you're really paranoid, you can bag the tassels of your corn by taking one of these, opening, opening them up, and gently closing the tassel, putting it in the bag, folding it, and stapling, close pinning, paper clipping, gluing, whatever you want to do to it, the night before you will pollinate the next day. When it is raining, do not bag your tassels. Otherwise, you'll come out with a lump that look like a dumpling, but smells absolutely rancid. And the see-through things, which are also come in a paper form, are called silk or shoot bags. These are the key thing if you're wanting to hand pollinate. These go over the ears after you cut the ear back. You do not go out with a pair of scissors and go snip, 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 and make one of those stretchy paper doll thingies. You cut off a half inch to an inch of the ear when the ears are fat. And if you've never seen a corn ear develop, you may not know what I'm talking about. If you have, you probably know what I'm talking about. The node that the ear will come out of will swell up, and the ear will start poking its way through. Usually they get really plump when the silk is getting ready to pop out. Usually you can cut them back when you have one or two silks pop out of your ear. Even if another corn was pollinating and you cut the silk off, the pollen can't go down to the developing kernel. So you pretty much cut off any contamination that you would have. And after you hand pollinate, whether you bag the tassels or you do what I do, go out the next morning, open up your tassel bag, gently bend the plant over, shake the tassel, let it fly back up, go through the entire row of what you have planted that is called bulk pollination. Other people will tell you to do what is called sib pollination. That's like crossing your brother and your sister or your aunt and your uncle. That's a very, you can do it, but you should not keep it going with your corn. You will end up ruining the gene genetic diversity because it causes what's called inbreeding. And you want to go through all of the plants of whatever variety you're growing shake all the pollen from them into this bag, shake it up, and go about pollinating the ear. And then you would take the bag, put the date when you pollinated on the bag, slip it over the ear, fold the two back flaps on these around the stalk, and staple them, or paper clip, clothespin, whatever. Staples usually hold the best. These keep any pollen from any plant reaching these ears. You need to pollinate very quickly. Any pollen in the air will attach itself to the silk. Corn silks have very fine hairs on them that are what the actual pollen sticks to. This pollen, when it hits these silks, germinates actually down to the kernel, fertilizes it within 24 hours. On the left is a picture of a tassel bag that I have put tassels in, shaken, and you can see some of the anthers are still in there, but this powdery stuff is pollen. Ideally, your corn pollen must be light yellow. If it is a very dark yellow, it is old and it will not be viable. You want fresh, light yellow pollen that smells like it will give you allergies. I'm actually allergic to corn pollen, which is very ironic since I grow it. I, I'm a gardener and I'm also allergic to a lot of other stuff. One of the other questions people are like, well, I don't know if my corn plant's gonna tassel. This right picture is a very key thing to know when your corn plant is gonna enter reproductive stage. When the corn plant's getting ready to produce a tassel, the leaves will begin to shorten and they will end up getting these funky lines in them that look like someone clawed the plant. All this means is there's a tassel developing in the center of this plant and it is preparing to pop its way out. 
Once it does, you'll obviously be able to see it. These are two other pictures of daily insensitive corn that I was growing. The one on the right left is from last year. That is a combination of corn from Mexico, Guatemala, and Ecuador and Colombia. On the right is a corn that is grown by the Mayans down in Guatemala that I had nice and happy and healthy until Hurricane Harvey blowed its way up to where we are, and this is flat on the ground now. It was 28 feet tall. I wanted to bring it to the expo, didn't think the airline would be happy if I tried. But these stalks are big around as my arm. They have roots coming up from the fourth nodule touching the ground to st stabilize themselves ideally, but they still end up blowing over when you get 100 mile an hour winds. In the regions where most of these come from, the indigenous peoples take soil and mound up around the stalk. The roots will grow through this and it'll help keep the plant stabilized, even in wind. Of course, if you're like Puerto Rico or somewhere that's been hit very devastatedly by a hurricane, your corn's gonna be a pancake. Sometimes they actually will pop back up and regrow, but most of the time they do not. When they blow over and lodge, that's pretty much it. Seed saving in corn is a very um, vital thing, and you must plant your corn accordingly to not have inbreeding. You want to plant 50 or more kernels of any variety in order to keep it from being inbred. And you want to bulk pollinate all of these. Ideally, one to 200 plants is perfect, but not all of us have a garden that gigantic to grow that, or a giant field in order to grow this. 50 or less, you will be encountering a very horrible inbreeding issue where your ears will shrink and your plants will become very sickly. When you harvest, you want to harvest your ears like they are on the left. Or if you leave them completely on the stalk when the whole thing dies down, they're completely brown and dry. When your ears are turning yellow and they're beginning to brown or they are browning, you can safely harvest these. Just peel back the shucks, twist them up, hang them on a clothesline, hang them in your house, put them on a rack or something that they can air out. And if you pull an ear too early, like on the right, the color will not be formed. If your corn is colored and you peel back the shucks and it, it is still white or the color is not vibrant, it is not ready to harvest and you do not want to pull that, unless you're going to eat it. If you're going to eat it, it's fine, but otherwise you don't want to do that. All of these are various containers that you could use for seed saving. Of course, you don't want to try to plant Nestle Toe House cocoa powder. You're not going to get a cocoa tree. but you can put seed in all types of things to save it for the next year or ever how long you want to. Plastic, of course, and glass are the better things. Vials, food containers, um, jars, Ziploc bags are amazing for this stuff. All of these can be used. You want to label them, what they are, when you grew them, who they came from, if it wasn't you, any notes that you want to add to this and you want to put your seed in the freezer, not the fridge, the freezer, if you have one. If you have a fridge, if you have a fridge but not a freezer, you can do that. When put in the freezer, they stay dormant. They do, all the bugs and diseases are killed when they're kept 32 degrees and below. And below is ideal. When you take these out to replant them, you want to thaw them about an hour before you plant. Otherwise, you may injure the seed when you plant it and it instantly gets heat. They may explode. Global maize, we will go through as many of these as we can. This is about showcasing the diversity that we have. And this is some of the stuff that I really value. Mexico and Central America have some amazing corn. It is gorgeous. All of these are found in Mexico. There's about 60 indigenous corns found in Mexico. Chapalote and Nautel are two of them. Palomero Tolaquino is one that Rafael, who's in the audience, is working with in bringing back. This is a popcorn that was worshipped by the Aztecs and human sacrifices that were offered to the rain gods and agricultural gods that this corn was associated with were necklaces, crowns, 
bracelets made out of the pop kernels of this ancient popcorn. It is nearly extinct. Hala is the longest eared corn in the world. These are tiny ears. These ears can get three foot long, and I'm not even kidding you. This is a very productive, very tall, very big stock corn, because in Mexico it is used as fence posts as well. Bofo is the speckled corn of Mexico that is very beautiful. I have an ear of it in the corn display. South America, I went to Peru in May on behalf of Baker Creek to collect seed. Chulpi here is the ancestor to all modern sweet corn. These are real ears, and yes, they are hand grenade shaped. The ancient popcorn that entered South America that would become Confite Morocho of Peru would end up making hand grenade shaped ears. This is Puka Chulpi red speckled corn from Peru, a brand new land race that I am working on describing. Pescaruntu or Piscaruntu means bird's eggs in the Quechua language. This is also found in Mexico and parts of Bolivia where it is called Chekchi. Cusco Gigante is the largest seeded corn in the world. You have kernels that are the size of a quarter and some that reach the size of a half dollar coin. The Incan Empire was fed off of this variety, and they were the ones that ended up actually creating it majority of the time, because they had to feed the numerous people that were in, in the empire. Here's a picture of a kernel, or kernels with a quarter. This is how large they actually are. And North America, we have mostly dent corn, like these yellow ones here. Reed yellow dent is very typical and very common. But I am running out, out of time, really. But I did write a book, Maze, Root Shoots, and Moccasin Boots. I have one copy with me that anyone can look at. You cannot have. They are on Amazon where you can purchase these. And I will be over in where all the squash are if you have questions or you want to come see the corn display that I have put together. I have some ears back at this back table, but for the other speakers, let's go over there so we do not disturb them. So thank you, everyone, and just please find me if you have questions.